many people here today. Um, I'm Laura Way. I'm the director at Green Hill. And uh, this is our Ramir Bearden um, session one of our panel discussion. First, I have a few things that you have to do. Um, this program would not have happened without a grant from the North Carolina Humanities Council. So we thank them. We also thank uh, Blue Cross Blue Shield in North Carolina and High Point Bank, which are supporting the exhibition and the reception tonight. And uh, speaking of the reception, 5.30 tonight, if you, are, if you haven't planned any events, come to our event. 5.30, we'll do a little walk and talk and 6 o'clock a reception. It'll be a lot of fun. So today, what we're doing is from now until 11.30, part one of our panel discussion, and we're going to be talking about Ramir Beard and putting him in context of 20th century art. And then it, we'll take a break. If you're coming back, we'll start again promptly at 1.30 and go till 3. And in that session, we'll talk primarily about the prints and the work that we have here. So first, I'd like to thank my panel for coming today. And I'm going to tell you a little bit about them. We're so honored to have three so wonderful, knowledgeable women about Ramir Bearden. First, let me introduce Deidre Harris Kelly. Ms. Kelly is the co-director of the Ramir Bearden Foundation in New York. Uh, where she's been working since 1996. Um, she's responsible for conducting the business as it relates to programming and uh, programming aspects of the foundation, developing and coordinating programming, uh, educational programming, supporting research and providing materials for exhibitions about bearding. She conducts workshops and lectures and um, like Ramir Bearden, she has a dual career because you're a working artist as well. So welcome. Um, Deidre has an MFA in painting from the University of Michigan and a BA in art from California State University in Long Beach. Next we have um, Allison Fleming. Dr. Fleming is the Chair of um, Art and Visual Studies at Winston-Salem State. Um, Allison has been my source of knowledge about Ramir Beard and she's been traveling around the state with me uh, as we do, um, we've been doing these at home chats going in and meeting, um, hosts have invited us into their home and we've been bringing Ramir Beard into people in Durham and Chapel Hill and with Salem and here in Greensboro. So it's been a great honor to get to know Ramir Beard and Allison. Um, Allison is, um, has her PhD from Penn State, her MA from Syracuse University, and a BA in Art History and Italian from Rutgers University. And then Janet Wall came up from Charlotte. Janet works for the Gerald Melberg Gallery in Charlotte. And many of you know, if you're a Bearden fan, uh, Gerald Melberg's gallery has uh, been representing and is known expert around Ramir Bearden. Um, Janet is like me. She is not, um, a, she doesn't have an art degree. She has a degree in an MBA in international business and a degree in in economics, but she's been the chief researcher for the Ramir Bearden uh, Kellogg Resume. Actually, I do have a master's certificate in American art. There you go. So, so <laughs> you better than me. Do it all. Yeah, mm -hmm. good job. So, without further ado, we're going to start. Um, I'm going to start a question to the entire panel, and they can just pitch in where they want. Since the time Greenhill first agreed to take in this collection, to exhibit and sell. We have been talking about Ramir Bearden to almost everyone we know, and yet we have found many who do not know about Ramir Bearden. Can you explain why he's such a hidden treasure? Why he's such a hidden treasure, or why people don't, more people don't know? <laughs> <laughs> um, because I could talk forever about why he's a treasure um, to this country. He was one of the foremost artists of the 20th century and was groundbreaking in his use of collage. Um, you know, in the 50s, many artists were using collage um, to work up ideas, but he was one who took it, a, you know, several steps um, beyond just that and came up with a very um, stylized, um, very complicated form in collage. Um, also, he was an institution builder. So uh, many artists, um, young artists, remember, you know, him on the picket lines at MoMA, or him, you know, talking to younger artists, directing them to ways that they could 
find people who would buy their work. Um, a young photographer talks, tells a story about going to Bearden and, you know, many people at this point um, would go to Romare in the 70s and sort of sit at his knee in a sense. I mean, he was an older artist and he had wisdom to share. So this younger artist went to him and wanted to be a photographer. Many people in here might know Chester Higgins, the name Chester Higgins, and he came to Bearden and Bearden suggested a long list of people he should go and photograph. Um, well-known people that then went on to buy his work, of course, because they were in the photographs, and then um, this helped Chester Higgins' career. So, um, you know, he was important because, too, he started institutions like, helped start the Studio Museum of Harlem, he had a nonprofit gallery, he was involved in many of the artist collectives in Harlem in the early day when no one was really getting shows. Um, but they were all trying to work together to make things happen for their careers and, and to support young artists. So he's important in that way. Um, and we still have artists, um, you know, showing their influence, showing his influence in their work. Um, when we celebrated his centennial, he would have been 100 years old in 2011, um, the Studio Museum of Harlem, um, you know, shared with us um, this idea to show artists um, that were influenced by Bearden's work. So what they did was, because amazingly a lot of these artists didn't realize their, the influence he had on their own work until they were posed with this question. You know, how does Bearden influence your work? And then, you know, they came up with these wonderful, wonderful um, works um, that were all done for the show. And um, it turned out that it was almost a year-long show. They had three different segments because they had so many artists responding. So I think he has this influence. Um, he also, you know, is here from Charlotte, um, but he uh, also had a great, great um, influence in New York. So um, why is he hidden? Well, there's, there's, a, there's a couple of answers to that, I think, because, you know, as a foundation that was started by his wife after his death, a lot of people don't realize he wanted a foundation. He asked for that in his will. Um, so Nanette, his wife, knew that this was um, something that he felt was important, that the legacies of artists go forward in some way, in some shape. He didn't really put a shape around it, but she, she made a shape for it. Um, if many of you may know that he wrote a book um, with Harry Henderson that was actually published. It was written, they spent about 10 years writing it, and then it was published after Bearden's death but it was about African, the history of African-American artists. Um, because he felt like this was important. If they're not in the books, if they're not in the survey books, you sort of don't exist. Um, so he wanted to make sure that that kind of work got done. And the legacy of artists and what he believed in, he wanted to make sure that was left. So she started the foundation, and a lot of people ask, well, why does he have a foundation? Why aren't there other artists that have foundations? And there's all sorts of calls we get about other African-American artists who they have no one to call. So, you know, if you want to use the work of Al Hollingsworth, who was a great artist, a painter in Harlem, there's no one to call about his work. You can call the people who have collected his work. You can't find a gallery that really carries his work. So um, we get the question, well, what do I do if I have this, that, you know, where do I go? How do I get it appraised? And so in that way, we, we play a role and we try to be a model for um, artist institutions um, who, you know, cover the legacy of, of African-American artists. Um, and I think, though, that still, you know, we have a foundation. He wanted it to be preserved. Um, but, and we have retrospectives every couple of years, but still there are people who don't know his work and part of it is about race. Um, I have to say that part of it is, you know, when we think about the prices of Bearden's work, he never, even with his contemporaries, he's never gotten the kind of prices for his work mm -hmm. that they did it went, you know, before they died. So you take, a, you take the span of uh, artist foundations now that exist. And none of them do what we do. We're very unique. Because we were not left with a huge endowment, most of them have an endowment and art. So they don't have to do programming. They don't do any of that public service 
stuff. They just take care of the work, which is, uh, you know, a feed in itself, and we do that. But we also do public programming, so we're constantly raising money. And people are like, why are you raising money? Bearden was this, you know, wealthy artist. He was not. Um, because his work always, you know, comes out. We have wonderful, beautiful shows. And then people forget. And then we got to do it again. Um, and, you know, Charlotte has done a wonderful thing in building a park. So this, is, this I think, is, is um, an interesting concept to the legacy of artists, mm -hmm. is making these permanent installations that become a place that people can go back to and, to and to recognize him. So I can now say that the Mint Museum exists because it has the most Beardens on public display. At any given time, you can go to Charlotte and see Bearden's work, right, and on, on display. You can't do that. You go into MoMA, they may have the work up. You go to the Met, they may have the block, which is the iconic work, but they may not. You know, it just depends. So I think, you know, some of those permanent installations like the park now in Charlotte is a, you know, memorial. And I can go on and on, so I won't. <laughs> <laughs> uh, I would just like to touch on a couple things that Deidre said. Number one, just for practical information, why perhaps is a little bit of a hidden treasure, is a lack of information recorded in, in like college textbooks, which Deidre alluded to. Uh, many times it's like one paragraph for the Harlem Renaissance. Mm -hmm. He was not a Harlem Renaissance painter or artist. Mm -hmm. That is from the 20s. I think he was about 10 or 11 years old at that time. He probably had art on his mind, <laughs> but he was not part of that mm -hmm. movement in the United States. So when you're boxed into one paragraph or less, and oftentimes incorrectly in, in texts or scholarly, um, information. This also has a tendency to make the, the light on certain artists much smaller. Mm -hmm. And you know the promotional efforts, what Deidre was saying, if, if it lacks a scholarly foundation, then the people in the business also might not place a certain importance or credibility that should be there. Mm -hmm. um, and then secondly, something that she just kind of alluded to is um, maybe a list, or she was talking about African-American artists in, in general. Um, when you start to put someone in a list or a, in, in a few small categories, I personally feel that that continues to box in the legacy of any artist. So think about a contemporary artist who is working in collage, who's gotten a lot of um, Press and recognition is one Chengi Metu. If, did I say her name? Wingechi. Wingechi Metu. She's an amazing artist, but if we keep boxing her, is it continually important to say she's a female artist? She's from Africa, so she's an African female artist. And now what are we going to do? Just take that and put that in a textbook and say, well, all the African female artists, you know what? She's an artist. She's an amazing artist. It's someone you should look up, just like Romer Bearden. There's lots of other people that were contemporaries of Bearden that worked in a similar genre in a certain um, um, working method, uh, Robert Rauschenberg. Mm -hmm. But why do we know more about Robert Rauschenberg than we do Romer Bearden? They're working, um, their contemporaries working at the same time in, in, in similar mediums. Um, so when we continue to label artists and put the, force them in small boxes, I feel that that also um, limits the legacy. That is, that is true to It oversimplifies right. the work yeah. and the ideas. I mean, yeah. Romare Bearden was an artist that said time and time again, he said it verbally, art is for everyone. Mm -hmm. But you know, that's also the gift that he gave us. He didn't just say that, that's what he put into his work. He took things that might have been important to a, a certain cultural group, but he made all of those things mm -hmm. universal and appealing mm -hmm. on a wide range. So, um, I'm not an artist, so I think there's, to me, there's a little bit of magic in that every time I see something. So. Well, it certainly does do artists a disservice when they're so strongly categorized, and of course this is what art history has had a tendency to do, mm -hmm. going back, you know, and, and looking at textbooks, and it's really only in the last couple decades that we've even begun to acknowledge artists of other races, other cultures, other genders. Um, even when I think about now the way that we teach art history surveys, how different it is than even when I was in college. Um, and 
which was really a long time ago, but you know, just in a couple decades, things have changed so much in that regard. But I, I do feel increasingly, maybe in the last couple of years, you will find references to Bearden as a great American artist, mm -hmm. more than you did a few years ago, where he was typically always described as one of our most prominent African American artists. Mm -hmm. So certainly I think that there's maybe small strides that are being made in that way to recognize this universality that you talked about and this kind of very, very large position that he held in the 20th century. I have been, I have to say, a little bit pleased. Um, Laura and I have done a couple radio interviews recently and so after that I've had people emailing me, calling me, people that I run into saying, oh I heard that interview and will tell me what their relationship with Bearden is, how much they love him, how they're looking forward to coming to see this exhibit. And, and these are people who are not artists, not art historians, people who I never knew had any connection to the art people that I know in other ways. And maybe it's because it is North Carolina, more people know him here than in other places. This is probably not so true if we were in Kansas. But, uh, but there are people out there who do know his work, who do admire his work, and I think that relatability factor, I'm sure this is going to come up again, um, you know, the way that Bearden is able to take images and make them relatable to many, many different mm -hmm. kinds of people is something that people, particularly in North Carolina, are attracted to. So, um, so I think that there is hope, uh, uh, you know, <laughs> in contrast to that kind of boxing in. Can you still hear us back there? Okay. Um, it was a perfect opening for my next question to Deidre. Um, will you please talk about Ramir Breer's North Carolina roots? I know that his family moved out of the South when he was a young boy, yet he continued to come back to North Carolina to visit his family, and it obviously plays a very important role in his work. Well, you know, as New Yorkers, we try to deny that history. <laughs> <laughs> you want to emphasize the New York part He's of like, He was a Harlem boy, you know. <laughs> no, um, born in 1911 in... Um, segregated Charlotte um, and part of the reason um, well the story he told over and over again um, was the story of um, his great-grandparents because he had he had his grandparents and his great-grandparents he was born into a family of mostly women um, around him and you know he was like the little golden boy um, you know and doted on and um, class, um, you know, he was, the, the, the um, family was somewhat middle class for their station, but I mean, as middle class as, um, as folks could be then because his grandparents were shopkeepers. His grandfather had a shop. And so, um, you know, he left when he was three. And he talks about this story a lot because I think it, it it means for him a type of rupture that he was not um, prepared for. And um, he tells the story of being outside of a shop uh, with his father in his father's arms and sort of being approached by, you know, a sort of small mob of people, um, of white people, you know, questioning whether Romare, who's very fair skinned, belonged to his father. Um, and it was soon after that that the parents decided that, you know, they wanted to leave and they went um, and they moved to New York, but then they also spent some time in Pittsburgh. So, um, but primarily when they got to New York, they stayed in New York and he was raised there. But, um, you know, this, this rupture, I think the story he tells over and over again is because North Carolina and Charlotte in particular had such fond, fond you know, um, memories for him were fond memories and had people that were just became indelible memories in his mind and he would go back for the summers and spend with his grandparents. So he didn't know um, Charlotte quite well um, as a child. Um, and then these paintings, all that he does in the 70s, the Mecklenburg series, is sort of after he goes back for a visit as an adult and um, and decides to work through these memories. Mm -hmm. So it's a it's a fascinating um, thing that he does. 